Hello there, happies. Are you ready for another? Another Singularity podcast? Well, I am. So, why don't you grab yourself a nice hot cup of coffee, maybe stop working for just a little while, kick back a little bit, relax, and listen to my podcast. Take it easy on yourself. You know, I'm working on this new Pipe Choir album. And just this past week or so, I've been working on this particular song. And uh, as I'm listening to it, you know, working on it, I'm like, what does this song remind me of? It sounds so familiar to me. Okay. And then I realized that it's the rhythm and the feel of the song is uh, very reminiscent of this song by John Lennon called Woman off of the Double Fantasy album, the album that he released just prior to his being murdered. And, you know, I think of this song, I think of John Lennon, I think of that album cover. You know, I I open up this file folder in my brain of all the things that are associated, at least in my mind, with John Lennon and Double Fantasy and how old I was, you know, what the weather was like, that, that time of uh, my life and uh, the things that were going on around me. And, um, you know, it's not a big deal or anything. Uh, Probably not something that's really worth talking about, but eh, this is a podcast that's not really concerned with, you know, anything like that. So I'm going to talk about it a little bit. Um, I kind of feel, I don't know if you agree, but when I hear the songs like Woman and it feels like just starting over, you know, there's a certain kind of sadness, I guess, that's attached to that music and to that time, probably because, you know, he was murdered uh, just after that album came out. And of course, I was just a little guy back in 1980. I was only, what, like nine years old when that song came out, when that album came out. And I didn't really understand a whole lot about John Lennon, like his politics and, you know, his controversial statements and all those kinds of things, like the the controversy and scandal around John Lennon. But I did sense from my older brothers and sisters and from what I was seeing on the television and things like that, that, that he was a relatively important person, Um, that his death was not something that was a small matter. It was a big deal to a lot of people. And I remember seeing the footage on television of the crowds and throngs of people gathered at what is now Strawberry Fields. And uh, they were just sobbing, you know, just they had lost this hero. And uh, like I said, I didn't understand all the minutia of the John Lennon situation, but I did get the impression that this was a pretty important person. So now that I'm an adult, okay, and I can look back on the situation with John Lennon and, uh, and I understand the background a lot more, And obviously, I'm a songwriter myself. You know, you can't be a songwriter, you know, in the modern era and not have an understanding of the Beatles or have an opinion one way or the other, right? And if you listen to my podcast for any amount of time, I'm sure you know by now that, you know, the Beatles are, at least in my best estimation, they're not even really a band anymore. They're like a, they're a standard. They're like Mozart, Beethoven the Beatles, you know, but I do remember the feeling of sadness and I remember it all over again when I hear the music from that album. And uh, it's funny how music can do that, isn't it? How when you hear a song, it can just transport you back in time to you know, the people that were around you, what they looked like, what was going on, what you were like, how old you were season that it happened you know was there snow on the ground I mean you remember everything at least I do you know it all comes back to me and uh, you know there's that like I said that file folder the John Lennon file folder 
that's in my brain and I pop it open, you know, whenever I hear uh, one of his songs, especially the songs off of Double Fantasy. Um, so, you know, um, I'm happy <laughs> with this track I'm working on. It's coming along really well, a little bit better than I thought it might. And uh, I'm kind of glad that uh, it's reminiscent, at least to me, of John Lennon, you know, of, of that time when he was killed. But it also gets me to thinking, okay, um, you know, I've heard the story, and I'm sure that you have by now, of, you know, John Lennon's assassin, you know. There's like, you know, documentary after documentary about that situation and the events that took place. And I gotta say that from my best estimation, the story that we've been fed about John Lennon's assassin, uh, Mark David Chapman, I think his name is, it's not even worth remembering. Um, I kind of get the sense, okay, in my, uh, what, uh, truther, skeptical mentality, okay, that the story we're being fed about the death of John Lennon is not entirely true, okay? Um, why do I say that? Okay, because it's reported, okay, that his assassin had been hanging out in New York City, kind of like waiting for his opportunity to come so that he could, you know, murder John Lennon. And, uh, you know, the reports are that while he was there, he was in this incredibly insane mental state where, you know, he was paranoid, schizophrenic, you know, flipping out, you know, just flipping the script like this guy was nuttier than a fruitcake. Yet in the reports of the story and the events, you know, leading up to the assassination of John Lennon, uh, apparently, Mark David Chapman, however crazy he was, you know, talking to the little people in his room or something, um, he was inviting prostitutes in, you know, to have sex with. Uh, that doesn't make any sense, okay? If you're schizophrenic, paranoid, flipping out, you're not going to invite some strange woman into your room, you know, some stranger who could be potentially dangerous or violent or whatever into your paranoid space, right? Not gonna happen. It's kinda like, <laughs> it's kinda like when they make the claim that John Kennedy, uh, the former president who was assassinated, you know, was out shagging all these chicks while he was married, right? But it's like, if you read the history of John Kennedy, you know, his medical history, um, he had severe back pain, okay? Crippling back pain from a back injury I think he received during the war. And and he even had like a special rocking chair that he would sit in to help him cope with the agony that he was in, probably on a daily basis, right? Now, think about that. You got a guy who's got chronic back pain, like crippling back pain. <laughs> How much boot knocking is he gonna be doing, you know? doesn't make any sense, okay? Well, the same is with the situation with this Mark David Chapman or whatever the heck his name is, okay? Like, it doesn't make any sense. He's paranoid flipping out in a hotel room and he's, you know, knocking boots with prostitutes? Uh, I don't think so. So, you know, honestly, okay, honestly, if you know enough about the history of John Lennon and the situation with his deportation from... New York City, you know, out of America and how they were trying to get him deported out of the country, uh, you know, and he won. He was successful. You know, he was able to stay. He, he won in court. He was able to stay in the United States as a citizen. Eh, it wouldn't surprise me if there was a faction of people maybe walking around out there that, you know, absolutely hated him. And, uh, you know, yeah, he won in court, but in the end, they got what they wanted. He was gone. He was removed from the equation. Is that a fact? No. Uh, it's an opinion, though. 
and it's one that I've kind of come to over the past 20 years or so, you know, just thinking about it. A lot of stuff with the assassination of John Lennon that doesn't make any sense, at least to me. And I guess I can share with you really quick, you know, I was visiting New York City back in the day when I was shopping my music to record labels in New York City. And that woman that was my liaison in New York City, you know, took me to the Dakota building. So I got to see it and I stood there and kind of stared at it. You know, no big deal, really. But when you consider the history and um, the profound change uh, culturally all over the world that came from those gunshots right there on that stoop that I'm staring at, you know. Pretty fascinating stuff. Anyway, I'm going to get a sip of my coffee here. You should probably do the same. Oh, man. Mm -mm -mm. The best cup of coffee I have ever had. So I'm going to share another story with you. It's kind of off the beaten path a little bit. A little bit of a hodgepodge kind of episode today. But... I want to talk about this very weird experience that both my wife and I had one day when we were going to the store to go shopping. Okay, so it was just a normal day. You know, we were just going to the store to buy some clothes. Okay, so we parked the car, we get out of the car, and as we're walking from our car to the entranceway of the store these two women kind of like come from the other side of the parking lot and they're kind of walking almost like lockstep with my wife and I, right? But what was really strange about this, and this is why I'm bringing it up, is because these women were kind of like grotesque, okay? And I don't mean that in an insulting way. One of the women had like blondish hair. The other woman had like red hair. And they looked almost like they were twins, okay? And they had their arms around each other as they were walking, almost like propping each other up. And they were kind of like hobbling, okay? Like like almost like they were bound to each other, okay? And they were so odd and so bizarre that both my wife and I like took notice of them and we kind of took notice that they were walking like in lockstep with us. So we kind of slowed down a little bit and let them go on ahead of us. And then we were able to kind of really get a good look at them. And they were just so strange. You know, they just stood out like they were so strange. And they were kind of like talking to each other but like really quietly and they were, I don't know. It was just like something was weird. They weren't, they weren't normal. Something was wrong with these two women. Well, what was even weirder was when we went into the store, it seemed, okay, that everywhere we went in the store, we would see these ladies. Like we would be in an aisle looking at something and they would come around the corner you know, so we would move on, go to another part of the store. Sure enough, these two ladies would pop up. Now, they weren't coming at my wife and I, okay? They were just kind of hanging around. They were just kind of there, but they were so strange, you know? It was so weird, and we hadn't said anything to each other while we were in the store, like while we were seeing these women. We just kind of were both quietly taking note of the fact that, one, they were totally weird and something was wrong, and that they seemed to be following us or they seemed to be everywhere we went. And afterwards, like in the car, you know, we both kind of were asking ourselves the question, like, what was that all about? Okay, like what was going on there? There was definitely something weird. And we both were kind of asking the question, like, were they even really there? Like, were we seeing something that other people couldn't see? Okay. 
Uh, trust me, it was that weird. They were that... Uh, the word is grotesque. I mean, they, they were... Man, I don't know. They seemed to be, like, maybe handicapped or something, or... Um, and propping each other up. They might have been drunk. Um, and they were constantly talking to each other, but from what I could tell, they were just kind of talking gibberish. And uh, so, I don't know. I guess they could have been really there. They could have been people. I mean, they looked like people. They weren't, like, transparent or something. But it's just one of those things I forget about. And then I remember it from time to time. And I thought, you know, I'm going to talk about that in this episode. Pretty weird. Isn't that weird? Have you ever had an experience like that? You know, we we hadn't had one quite like that before. It was a little weird. Even by my standards, it was pretty damn weird. Um, anyway, so another thing I want to talk about today. And man... This is one I could probably devote a whole episode to. In fact, I probably will after this one. I'll probably, you know, somewhere down the line, do a really in-depth investigation into the situation. But what I want to talk about today is this thing I found out about called the D-Wave machine, the Delta Wave machine. And what the Delta Wave machine is, at least from my best understanding, okay, is a device, a computer... Okay, a quantum computer that's been invented, built, and is now operating. And the claim with this Delta Wave machine is that it's really kind of like it's a way to contact other dimensions using quantum computing, you know, quantum physics. Okay, so it's like a Ouija board, but it's a computer. Okay. And the claim is that they can actually go into other dimensions, uh, ask questions about things, and get answers from beyond. Now, this all sounds like a Twilight Zone episode, okay? I mean, it sounds way out there, but trust me, this is real. This thing exists, okay? Whether it actually does what they claim, I don't know, but I wouldn't doubt it. You know, (laughs) I wouldn't doubt it. Although I will say this, okay? I pay a lot of attention to YouTube and that kind of stuff. I watch a lot of that stuff. And one of the things I'm constantly hearing about is artificial intelligence, right? And just how advanced, you know, artificial intelligence is and all that. And uh, I wouldn't say that I completely disagree with that, okay? It's probably, you know real to a certain degree, okay? But I'll tell you what, every time they show one of those robots, you know, on YouTube or something, where they they claim that this is the state of the art, you know, AI robot, okay? There's one, I think it's called Sophia. (laughs) It's so stupid. You gotta be kidding, you know? Like every time I see that thing, like a video of it, you know, talking about the future or some stupid thing like that it looks like (laughs) like one of those automatons from disney world (laughs) it's not anywhere near you know being human okay and i hear the claim a lot that they're like really really close you know to making a robot that will surpass you know human intelligence and human capability And I don't know, this thing that they're pushing front and center as the prime example, this robot Sophia or whatever it's called, it's like, oh, brother, you know, facepalm. Are you serious? Are you serious? Like, this is the best that you have. And you're making the claim that you're just, you know, a hair's breadth away from surpassing the human being. Eh, I don't think so. Maybe like in computing power or something they are but when it comes to the physical you know attributes of the human being you know what they'll probably never never be able to create a robot that can move and work and operate like a human being i'm sorry 
I don't think so. Anyway, that's just my opinion. I hope you're not offended if you're one of those people who's all about the future and all that kind of thing. But I don't know, man. You can believe what you want. I'm not buying it. I think it's all kind of a little bit hokey. Um, so back to the Delta Wave machine, this crazy machine that they're using to communicate with other dimensions. Um, okay. So when they say other dimensions, what exactly are we talking about here? Like who and what are they communicating with, with this Delta Wave computer? Okay. Um, I guess in case you haven't heard of it before, you can just Google it. Just like anything else these days, you just type it in. Bam, there you go. Anything you want, you can find it. One of the only great things about modern technology. Um, okay, so I guess there's an interview with a guy, like a seminar or something, with the guy who's like the spokesperson for this Delta Wave machine community. Okay, and he says it himself. Okay, that with this device, they are summoning the demon. Okay, he actually says it, right? That they are summoning the demon. And he says it tongue in cheek, right? Like it's, you know, like they're, they're really tapping into the evil potential. Okay, but maybe he means it literally. <laughs> okay, maybe it's not meant as a figure of speech. Maybe they are actually using this machine to tap into that kind of thing. And I got to tell you, if that's the case, okay, why, why, why would you ever want to mess around with anything like that? I just don't get it. It's like, I get the sense from these scientists that are working in like artificial intelligence, you know, trying to bring about you know, the singularity, you know, uh, the time when the, when the computer surpasses the human being. Okay. Um, I get the sense from these guys that they're like those nerdy, you know, guys that like in the movies where, you know, they're creating the monster like Frankenstein, you know, and they think to themselves, I'm going to create this horror, <laughs> this monster, right? But It'll do what I say. <laughs> it'll, you know, it'll answer to me, you know, everything will be okay, you know. And then, of course, in the end, you know, the, <laughs> the monster runs amok, right? Uh, kills the creator, you know, and goes on a rampage, you know. Well, I get the sense from these guys that it's probably something like that. Like, they think it's going to be hunky-dory. You know, they're going to create these robots that are going to be really smart, you know, smarter than people. But everything's going to be all right, you know. <laughs> they're going to be our friends. <laughs> get out of here. What's the matter with you, you know? <laughs> You've got to be kidding, right? I don't know. I don't have any faith in those guys, you know, and I just, I see the stuff that they're doing, whether it's real or not. I don't know. I don't know. It probably is though, to at least to a certain degree, they wouldn't be talking about it, you know, or showing it if there wasn't some truth to it. You know, I, I guess there's the whole fear mongering thing that a lot of people seem to be going for these days, you know, trying to scare you, you know, like fear. Uh, of the future, you know, trying to make you afraid of what's coming. But just watch the Sophia video, you know, and listen to the dialogue from these guys and make a comparison between the Sophia video and the claims of these scientists. And it's like, oh, brother, get out of here. Like I said, in my opinion, they'll probably never do it, it'll probably never happen. What do you think? You probably disagree with me. Eh, that's okay. I can handle that. It's okay to disagree. Well, that's another thing we could talk about, isn't it? The right of dissent, you know, in the modern era. 
Like, we live in this time where you're hearing about it almost constantly, right? Like, YouTube creators getting their channels shut down because they're being, you know, censored or whatever. Because they're saying things that are controversial to someone, right? Um, And they're being shut down and all that kind of stuff because they have a difference of opinion. I'll tell you what, it kind of makes me a little bit worrisome about the future. But I'll tell you another thing. It also makes me wonder about the future of something like YouTube. You know, like, can it really exist for very much longer if it continues to practice censorship like that? I don't know. I don't know. I would imagine that if they keep going in that direction, that it would only be a matter of time before some other multi-billionaire comes up with a better idea than YouTube and they just eclipse everything that YouTube has done, um, it could happen. That could happen. I think we live in a time where that kind of thing is possible. As unimaginable as it might be to a lot of people that something like YouTube is big and is widely used and as popular and important, socially important, as YouTube uh, could go the way of the dodo bird, you know? Uh, It is, like I was saying in that last episode about, you know, Enron and capitalism and regulation and deregulation, you know, that is the natural course of capitalism. Kind of like a, I hate to admit it, okay, but kind of a Darwin-esque aspect to capitalism. Where it's the survival of the fittest. And I gotta say, in my opinion, that if YouTube continues down this path of censorship, whatever's going on, oh man, I think it's just a matter of time. You know, people will stop tuning in, you know, and they'll go somewhere else, you know. And I don't think it's gonna be something like Vivo or something like that. I don't think so. I think it's going to be a platform that doesn't exist yet. But like I said, some rich, smart dude somewhere, probably at MIT, like down the road from where I live, uh, will come up with something that will eclipse YouTube. And wow, can you imagine? Can you imagine that happening? You know, uh, maybe it'll be an open source form of YouTube, something like that, where You know, there are no restraints. There is no limit, you know. Um, I don't know. Could be. Could be. Anyway, so, you know, lately, where I live, okay, the area that I live, there's been this controversy that's popped up, um, and it's really strange. Okay, it has to do with graffiti being written on bathroom walls in schools in the area that I live. And um, basically what's happening is they're finding these swastikas being written on bathroom walls. And, you know, because of the current climate that we live in, whenever a swastika pops up in a bathroom, you know, it's all of a sudden like a news story. Like it's this big hate crime that someone drew a swastika on a bathroom wall. Now, I get that, okay, I get that, at least to a certain degree, but um, I think a lot of people are being reactionary. They're overreacting to this, okay, because I'll tell you what, ever since I was a little kid, I mean, we're talking kindergarten, okay, five years old, I mean, there was stuff getting written on the bathroom walls, like, forever, you know, uh, there'd be a penis, you know, this huge penis, dri- you know, drawn on the wall with a Sharpie and it says like eat dick or something like that. You know, it'd be like that kind of stuff, you know, um, and even things like swastikas and crosses, you know, symbols, you know, and stuff like that. And it wasn't a hate crime. It wasn't anything serious. It was some stupid kid with a Sharpie, like, being stupid. (laughs) You know? That's all it is. That's all it is. 
But now there's this wave, and I'll call it that. It's a wave of these swastikas, you know, these these hate symbols, you know, popping up in bathrooms all over Massachusetts, apparently. Okay. And I'll tell you what, I'm going to tell you what I think. Okay. I think that it's not kids drawing those swastikas on the bathroom walls. I think it's probably adults that are doing it because they know it'll be a news story, right? And it works towards this agenda, let's say, this political objective that a certain faction of people are aiming for, right? Um, It wouldn't surprise me at all if we find out in the future that there were these agent provocateurs, you know, that were operating inside of school buildings even, you know, teachers or whatever, that are going into the bathroom with a Sharpie, they draw a swastika on the wall, and then they call it in to the news. And they say, hey, there's a hate crime happening here in our school. I'm probably not the only person who thinks that way, but I'm probably one of the only people who really you know, see it that way. Um, and I can live with that. That's okay. I don't know for sure. I never claim to know anything for sure. But it's just opinions, right? It's only opinions. That's all it is. Even if somebody draws a swastika on a wall, uh, it's an opinion or something. You know, it's not, it's not a news story. It shouldn't be, but for some reason it is, you know. Which reminds me, now that I'm thinking about it, um, you know, there was a situation here in Massachusetts about maybe a year ago, maybe over a year ago now. I think it was not this past winter we're coming out of, but maybe last winter. There were a bunch of homes in the Massachusetts area that had a gas leak problem okay and their houses either exploded or the gas leaks were so bad that the people had to evacuate their homes okay and the reason I'm bringing this up is because today okay to this day that problem has still not really been resolved the people who were having issues with their heat over a year ago, the problem is still there. It hasn't been resolved. Isn't that crazy? Can you imagine? What excuse could there possibly be to allow any household in modern America to go for a solid year with a gas leak that never gets fixed, never gets remedied a year later? Are you kidding me? You've got to be kidding me. You've got to be kidding me. And that's the case. It's true. It's true. We know a couple of families. My wife and I know a couple of families that are still dealing with this problem. Can you imagine? Can you imagine? What excuse could there possibly be? I don't know. I just can't think of one. I just can't think of one. That's reasonable. Think about that. It's pretty crazy. That can happen in modern America, you know, a modern city, that kind of stuff can still go on. Like, what? What? Uh, So that's about all I'm going to say for today. Got to get back to work. It was great talking to you. I hope that you have a good week. I'll talk to you next week. And with that, this is Mike Bostwick from Pipe Choir Records signing off. And remember, folks, If you want to keep what you've got, you've got to give it away. Take it easy.